It was a fight for the ages. 49 rounds, three and a half hours. It was the longest and most brutal fight of the 20th century. It is a fight to the finish. Each was trying to prove that he was the better man, no matter what it took. No matter how many punches, no matter how many rounds. The punishment that they took is amazing. Either man was still alive. Joe Jeanette was one of the top fighters of his era, but was denied a chance at the title. It wasn't because he was black. It was because he was black and he was really good. Rejected by America, he traveled to Paris to fight in what was considered to be the black heavyweight championship of the world. Jeanette was knocked down 27 times, but never knocked out, bled dry, and pounded to the ropes. Something kept pulling him off the mat. The one thing left to fight for, pride. Next on Amazing Sports Stories, the true story of Joe Jeanette, the boxer who refused to quit. As a 25-year-old blacksmith's son, Joe Jeanette worked hard for a living, hauling coal, driving trucks, whatever it took. It was a harder time, it was a more physical time. Far more people did physical labor 12 hours a day. So to defend yourself with your hands was far more important in those days than today. So Joe Jeanette probably had been in many, many street scraps prior to ever thinking of putting on the boxing glove. It was a simple dare that led to Joe's first bout. A lot of times a fighter would barnstorm, go into these small towns, and basically, it really was a theater show. They'd put up posters and say, hey, you can win $3 if you can stay three rounds with me. Jeanette took on that challenge at the behest of his friends. He didn't win that fight, but he showed pretty well. He showed some natural ability. And he said, geez, I just made $3 in 15 minutes, it takes me a week and a half to make $3. If a black man had a fight, even some kind of pickup fight somewhere, and someone paid you $25 for the fight, that was incredible. That was far more money than the average black farm worker or sharecropper was going to make. You'd be lucky if he made $25 in a year. For a black man, going into boxing might not be a bad thing compared to the other options that may be open to you. It was a different world. It was a new century, but old hatreds raged on. Liberated by law, but chained by prejudice. Black Americans lived under a violent and oppressive regime. Lynchings in the South, race riots in the North. For Joe Jeanette, the best fights were found on the streets. Most doors were closed to them. There weren't even Negro baseball league teams then. The only door open to an athletic black youth was boxing. Within two years, Jeanette was one of the most talked about young boxers on the scene. Unlike today, they would fight once a week. Today it's five months, six months, they'd fight once a week. This was their living. One week in Denver, and the next week in Salt Lake City, and the next week in Sacramento. And with rare exception, the best fighters were black, and the color line was used by white fighters that they didn't have to fight the best fighters. As a boxer making a living in the ring, fighting white men and winning posed its own set of problems. They could take a calculated risk to show up at a fight with death threats and put that out of their mind. I mean, it takes a different kind of person to be able to do that. Joe Jeanette could do that. He had to do it. Jeanette could be a panther. Long jab, good, great right hand, great right hand. He's a very aggressive fighter that uh, relied a lot on his right hand, and when the right hand wasn't good enough, you know, there's a left hook quickly behind it. Look at his record, 157 fights. He lost nine times. One of the single greatest fighters ever to live. Jeanette was just four years into his storied career in 1908, yet he was already 30 years old. 
There have been wins, a lot of them, including decisive knockouts, but no shot at the title. But all that could change. For a new heavyweight had emerged, the first black champion in history, Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson has defeated Tommy Burns for the heavyweight championship of the world. World title fights are big to day, but back then they were surreal. Holding a title meant that you were basically the baddest man on the planet. Symbolically, it means a victory over the white man. Two years later, the nation's fears were realized when James J. Jeffries, the great white hope, challenged the new champion and paid the price. The blacks came out to celebrate after Johnson B. Jeffries had taunted the white man a little, at which point the white man decided that that was enough. We can lose in the ring. We're not going to lose here. And there were killings in every big city in America. Jack Johnson's trouncing of white opponents was sweet vindication for Joe Jeanette and the other top black fighters, who for so long had been barred from fair fights by white officials. Would Jeanette's dream of winning the heavyweight title now be realized? Surely Jack Johnson, a man of his own color, would give him an equal shot. All too soon, Joe discovered he was wrong, dead wrong. Heavyweight Joe Jeanette had risen up from the streets of Union City, New Jersey, to become one of the top fighters of his era. But the time's seething prejudice denied him a title shot. Then Jack Johnson shocked the establishment with his defiant victory over Tommy Burns. Fellow black boxers believed that change was in the air. I think the other black fighters looked at Johnson as now that he's champion, maybe we're going to get our shot. Now that barrier has been broken. They probably were thinking at the time that blacks will always be fighting for the heavyweight championship. Jack Johnson, he did everything he could to flout, not just as being the heavyweight champion, but as being the black heavyweight champion. He not only cavorted with white women, he married them. He would race cars 100 miles an hour down the wrong way streets. He thumbed his nose at white society as much as he could. And it was probably the worst thing that happened to white America, and they had to get their crown back. What really could have been the Jackie Robinson of boxing really turned out to be a far worse chapter in America's history. America's racism was like this scab, and Jack Johnson just kept picking it. And every time it healed a little bit, he'd pick it a little more. You know, just saying, hey, white America, I'm the best there is, and you can't beat me, and come and try. And then when they sent their men at him, he basically slapped them around and laughed at them while he was doing it. Jack Johnson wasn't looking for any great challenges. He was looking to make some money. After he became champion, he didn't want to defend his championship against another black man. He was so proud of being the first black champion that he wanted to be the only black champion. Johnson got a certain kind of ego charge out of being the first black. I've got it. and. Uh, well, you other guys, well, <laughs> too bad for you. All of this left Joe Jeanette on the outside looking in, biding his time, waiting, and hoping for a shot at the title. And Jack Johnson had reason to be wary. They'd fought several times before, and although Jeanette never triumphed, he'd given the future champ all he could handle. The reason Jeanette didn't get the title shot wasn't because he was black. It was because he was black and he was really good. The truth is, the champion Johnson and the outsider Joe Jeanette had much in common beyond their fighting skills. For Joe, too, was married to a white woman. To him, though, their love was not something to flaunt. 
He was very loving, and she was very loving. She did not tell her mother until after they were already married. My great-grandmother was very opposed to the marriage. But then, of course, once kids come along, that changes everything. Interracial marriages in the United States at this time were illegal in, in many places. It took a certain amount of uh, fortitude and guts if you were going to marry outside of your race. And obviously, he was constantly traveling with his wife, with his family, around the country and then around the globe eventually, and subjecting themselves to more racism. My aunt traveled one time with him down south, but people threw stuff at him, so she didn't go back again. With a family at home, Joe needed fights. Up and down the eastern seaboard, he'd travel, where small bouts paid even smaller purses. Joe longed for the chance to claim a piece of the championship long denied, this time on his own terms. It was then that Europe called. The exotic black fighter was an irresistible spectacle. There was money to be made there in England, in Paris, and they particularly loved the black boxer. The Europeans seemed to be rather taken with African Americans generally, with African American culture. It seemed, you know, exotic, different, primitive. They were able to better make a living over there uh, than over here. April 1909, Paris, France. The stage was set for an epic clash. Joe Jeanette and Sam McVeigh, another man denied a shot at the title. Three minute rounds. One of you goes down, the other one goes to. Would meet in what was billed as the Colored Heavyweight Championship. They were both bitter, angry, and ignored by a common foe, Johnson. And yet neither man could know. They were about to fight the most brutal struggle in boxing history. The century was young, but old hatred still raged. So one of boxing's greatest fighters, Joe Jeanette, would wait in the wings, while champion Jack Johnson, who refused a fair matchup against his black rivals, slayed each and every great white hope. Paris in the spring of 1909 would be the stage for a sensational matchup. Jeanette versus Sam McVeigh, a fight billed as the colored heavyweight championship of the world. Both fighters had been cruelly passed over by Jack Johnson, so to them, it was a payday. They had yet to learn the costs. Joe Jeanette was more of a technician. McVeigh was a puncher. He was a puncher first. His, his idea was to get in close to you and hit you as many times as he could and, and try and hit that one that, that hurt you. McVeigh felt confident. He'd beaten Joe in Paris once before and looked forward to the rematch. But this time, there would be no judges, no scorecards. The fight would not be limited by number of rounds or knockdowns. And basically, you can fight until last man standing. Pretty barbaric when you think about it. It's no surprise that this fight was epic. The fight started, McVeigh caught Jeanette in the first round with the right hand. That right basically put Joe Jeanette on Queer Street. He just went dizzy. By the end of round 17, he had been down 21 times. Jeanette calls up every reserve he has, every technique he has, everything he has just to survive. Jeanette willed himself to consciousness when his vision went dark. Finally, about the 19th round, his head clears from the punch he received in the first round. The fog parted and he saw the path to victory. One, two, three. A 
Awakened from his daze, Joe Jeanette poured it on. Now, it was Sam McVeigh who retreated. On and on it went, round after round, knockdown after knockdown. This fight is over three hours of pummeling, beating, falling down, getting up. It's amazing even man was still alive at <laughs> Hollywood is still alive, they even went on fighting. It was bound to be a classic. Neither man backing down, neither man giving in. You built your fans by your blood and guts performances in those rings. I mean, what are you risking by not getting up against Sam McVeigh? You're risking a lot. Jeanette wasn't finished. With no title to be had, it was he alone who could declare himself the champion. Jeanette seemed to take total control of the fight. But Sam McVeigh, true warrior, would not stay down. An exhausted Jeanette could only look on as 19 times McVeigh went down and 19 times he again arose. McVeigh's left eye is closed. His right eye is beginning to close. Now it's just a matter of who's going to outlast the other one. What's in these fighters who keep getting up and keep getting up? Well, it's one part adrenaline, two parts pride. At that point, it's beyond money. That's just about personal will. And for whatever you make of it, it is one of the great, great fights of all time. It had been three and a half hours, and the 50th round beckoned each brutalized fighter. Pummeled, drained, and bleeding, Joe Jeanette reached down to his marrow for the strength to carry on. No boxer would ever be asked to answer so many bells. And for one of the two, was one bell too many. I can't. I can't. This wasn't just a victory for Joe Jeanette. It was a symbol of defiance and a claim on the championship denied to boxing's greatest fighters. After years of struggle, pain, and oppression, in Joe's mind, he truly held the title. And though he'd never faced Johnson or anyone else for the title, after Johnson lost in 1915, it would be 22 years before a black man was champion again. Where does he rank in his era? He was about as good as it got. He didn't win the title, which is unfortunate, but he went up against the very best, and he did very well against the very best. What more could you ask of an athlete than that? Could Joe Jeanette have changed the perception of what white America thought a black man was? It's romantic to think, wow, what could it have been like if he was champion? Because he was this wonderful guy who was upstanding. What could they pick on? What could they attack him about? Jeanette retired at the age of 40. But unlike many of his contemporaries, he did not end up destitute and penniless. He opened a gym, trained boxers. Later, turned it into a garage and started a limo service. While his marriage to a white woman may have rankled many of his Union City neighbors, it never seemed to matter to his devoted extended family. Nobody had ever said, we're different than them or they're different from us. It didn't really matter. It was just family and pretty young at heart. And he liked to tease. When he'd tease you, he'd go, look at the birdie. And you'd always have to look up, and then he'd tuck you under the chin. He used to like to play with you. Yeah, it just seems like a weird thing for him to be a boxer and then be such a gentle person. Joe Jeanette died in 1958 
at the age of 79. In 1997, he was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. I don't know that Joe Jeanette is overlooked. He's almost obscure. He happened before there was film. There's none found of him. I put to you that Joe Jeanette should be remembered, and he doesn't need film to remember him. The fact that we're talking about Joe Jeanette, you know, some hundred years later, um, is a testament to, to what kind of fighter he was.